Hey folks, this is Ben from Road to VR here at CES 2014, and we just got to check out a really cool demo from Next3D. They're working on some 3D sports broadcasting, and they want to bring it to the Oculus Rift. So, can you tell me a little bit about uh, about about your vision for this and what you want to do? Sure, absolutely. So, um, Next3D produces um, encoder technology that's designed for bringing uh, stereoscopic images over relatively low bandwidths to end users. And so, we began working. Uh, about a year and a half ago on bringing stere the stereoscopic environment into the Oculus Rift, specifically in a way that's stereo-orthogonally correct. And so that means that when you view a recorded environment, like a football field, using our technology in the Rift, um, the players should seem the right size, everything should seem the right distance away, the, the travel of your head from left to right and up to down should be as if you were there. And so, so the idea is you put it on your head and you do have a very strong visceral sense of being at the event. So that's sort of the experience. And then live sports is sort of a low-hanging fruit for this because it's, it's, we found it to be very compelling in early tests and the broadcasters that we've talked to have also found it to be a very compelling experience and something they'd like to bring to their viewers. And now live broadcasting is obviously a very expensive industry and although they like new technology from time to time, they're not crazy about change. Have you found the reaction uh, good or positive in the way that you think maybe this is something they're going to want to latch on to uh, thus far? Uh, it's been very uh, very positive. Every, every time we, we, seem, we seem to be testing more and more content, different types of content, everything from kickboxing to boxing to basketball, uh, football, um, and, and even even things that we thought might not be compelling, we're finding are very compelling. Um, a lot of the things that we've, uh, our background goes back in, in, in 3D, um, in, in both IMAX films, films for IMAX theaters, I should say, and, and for television and sporting events. Uh, actually here in Vegas, uh, worked on the first live 3D sports cast for the NBA All-Star Game. So a lot of the differences in filming that in 3D so a lot of that we're finding applies to this, um, or the approach to this. That, but there's even like a step further that you would go creatively in how you would cover this uh, in orthogonal or virtual reality, um, which is pretty exciting from a creative standpoint. My background is a, is a filmmaker and a technologist, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the most immersive medium I've ever uh, experienced as, as a, from a creative standpoint. And I've uh, filmed and shot uh, multiple films for IMAX theaters, which before this was the most immersive medium on the planet. You're right to say, though, that the broadcasters have a hesitancy. They have just had this experience with 3D, where 3D was going to change, was going to be a sea change, and then the audience didn't materialize. And so they have heard this sort of thing before, and there is a resistance to it, because there's a serious expense to upgrading the infrastructure to bring the signal, to bring any kind of new signal to a new display device. Um, but we had a, an interesting experience at a major broadcaster, I won't name names, where uh, recently, and the CTO said, I think I know how radio f felt when television walked in the room and gave their pitch. So they're, they're definitely, they see like we do, the compelling nature of it. And how about uh, just your, your everyday viewer? Have you given many demos where people say, uh, like 3D, they just say, eh, it's okay, or are they, are they blown away and they say, I want to watch games like this? I haven't had, I, I have had almost no one who's, who isn't completely wowed by the experience. Um, and that's great. That's what you expect. You don't want someone to say, eh, I, I can take it or leave it. What, what, we hit the wow, I'd say we're in, the, we're in the high 90s, but we have to get from wow to watch. We have to get from the five-minute demo that everybody kind of loves to what you would to a to a, a, a an hour-long or even a two-hour-long sporting event or a two-hour-long movie or an hour-long reality reality show. So, can we get from wow to watch and address all those factors of comfort and um, just the the right hitting the right demographic with the right content? And that's really where where we're focused right now. And you guys, so we had a, there was a there was a kid that that tried this on and was watching uh, first time he'd ever seen any VR. And he's in Southern California, and he said, he, was, he took it off and said, wow, he goes, does this mean when my dad can't take me to a Lakers game, I can get this and go to the Lakers game? And he, he referred to it in the, in the first person, like, I can get this and go to the Lakers game without my dad if he can't take me. Uh -huh. And the next thing I get a call from his dad going, when are those available? Where do you get those? <laughs> so, um. And so you guys are dealing a lot uh, in sports, I think, because of your background, but you mentioned movies. 
do you see that being an area that you're going to go into? Do you think it'll be sports first, then movies, or do you think that they're going to get on that all at the same time? I, I, you know, I think there's room. There's a lot of people exploring a lot of things. So my, my background as a, as a filmmaker, as I said earlier, is, is in uh, motion picture films, films for IMAX theaters and giant screen cinema, uh, feature film sports, and uh, even documentaries. And, and the, from uh, you know, the background of that and, and being involved in 3D uh, for the past decade or more as a, as a filmmaker, this is, this is like the holy grail of what someone's always after. The unachievable image is the image that would take you somewhere where you, you know, and feel and sense the same as the filmmaker was there. So uh, this is, you know, IMAX type screens, those large cinema screens were fully immersive, are very immersive. This is fully immersive. And so the opportunity to do narrative uh, films in this is really compelling. Uh, the, to do a documentary where you go to Yellowstone National Park or you go to the top of Mount Everest and you stand there for real um, and actually take students from classrooms or just interested people um, is, 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 uh, is about as exciting as I could ever imagine. I wish this came out like 20 years ago. So. Can you give me some detail about the, about the process, about the camera rig that you're using, um, including the audio, and then a little bit about, about how you're taking that and converting it for the Rift? Sure, so the center of the solution is the encoder and decoder. There's a camera rig in front and obviously the, play, the player technology on the other side. But our core technology is actually encoder and it's responsible for a lot of the magic here. And so the camera rig is a very high resolution stereoscopic front facing camera with very wide field of view optics, about 177 degrees field of view optics as a front facing camera. Our encoder can allow up to four of those, so we actually can we can actually build a 360 degree rig, and the encoder will, will, will deal with that. A lot of applications that's overkill. It's a lot of expense, and you don't want to waste a stream, a, a televised stream, uh, to shoot the back of a stadium, which is covered with trash. Um, and so, for a lot of environments, the, the front facing 180 is is where the action is and where the big camera is. And so what we do in those instances, we have a rig called a halo rig, which basically takes lower, not lower resolution, but lower temporal resolution, lower frame rate pictures of the surrounding environment, and then the encoder stitches that together. We also can just synthesize the background. We can, we can create it uh, out, of the, out, out of the pixels that are there, or we can put a CG background in, back, background in as well. So the front facing 180 camera is sort of the, uh, the most important piece of the puzzle, and then we solve the, the rest of it. The other thing about 180 I'll mention is, if you're sitting on a couch like this, it's very uncomfortable to, to Linda Blair around and look at what's behind you. So, so again, most of our audience is facing forward. The encoder takes that live signal or, or a recorded signal. It corrects for the distortion that the camera introduces, and it also computes the stereo, it's calibrated so that the or the stereo orthogonal nature of the scene is accurately represented, and that's done by, by calibration. Then it transmits the signal at very low bit rates, and this is actually a 4K times two, one for each eye signal as it's transmitted, and we can do it in about eight megabits a second. And then on the decode side, there's a lot of magic as well so that we can decode it in real time and, and provide a look around at very, very high frame, frame rates, refresh rates as you, as you look around. We have PC working now. We're, we have uh, Mac OS right behind it. We're also working on Android and, 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 and Steam. And can you give me a little additional detail about what you're doing with audio and also uh, the frame rate that we're looking at here? Um, and uh, let's say four years down the road we have 4K riffs. Is your solution going to be able to work and decode that at, at your, your proposed frame rate? It, it absolutely will. We can go to 4K display right now. In fact, that's the other application for our, our, our current our current broadcast solution is actually as a 4K broadcast system for non-RIF display devices for 4K television. Um, so as the display, we, 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 our signal uh, is, fu is future-proofed, and even with the current camera configurations, but cameras are evolving as well. DJ's shooting at, at 6 meg now and at 6K now, and, and um, uh, so you know, that's a relatively simple piece of, of the puzzle as, as it's, hopefully we will need more resolution so that when we deconvolve and rectify the image, we're still getting a super crisp for, you know, 4K. That would, that would, that would be ideal.
there's, there's a bit of the analogy that you know, even when it was just an HD world, that you know, 4K makes better HD than HD. Yeah. So 6K, yeah. 8K, you know, as the world progresses, it'll make uh, better 4K. You, you definitely want to oversample. But the other thing you mentioned, actually, when we talked earlier, is is the idea of these things being tethered and wireless, and so. Transmission bitrate is a huge issue, and we're at eight megabits a second to do 4K. And as, as that, ha if that necessarily has to grow, it's going to become. Uh, it, it, the, the, in order to make this most applicable to the audience, we've got to be very cautious of, of, of bitrate as well. So even if we wanted to send a 5K image right now to deconvolve, we probably wouldn't. We'd send the sharpest possible 4K for the display that we can. And one last question for you guys. Um, let's say I am looking forward to watching Super Bowl 2014 on my Rift. How how are you going to get there? Is it is it just about convincing the broadcasters that this is what's next, or do you is it a chicken and egg problem with with getting people who have the equipment? From for for the most part, the broadcasters are going to skate to where the puck is, not where it's going to be. So they're going to want to see an installed base, and they're they're um, they have had. They are fresh off an experience with 3D TV where the installed days didn't materialize. But the manufacturers all said, we're going to build these things, so you should be broadcasting in this format. And then unfortunately, the audience didn't, did, did, didn't show up. So this is sort of fresh in experiential memory at all, all of these, these broadcasters. And so they will proceed cautiously. They've also had that same experience with HD in terms of HD um, uh, um, installed base and the acquisition curves. And so, um, but in terms of sort of the firsts, there also is a uh, sort of a rich tradition in sports broadcasting of being the first to do sort of anything. So I think you'll see some big marquee things happen relatively fast, even for a small audience, because of how compelling this is and how different this is and how this could herald in a sea change. There are a lot of broadcasters that are sort of vying for, well, we'd like, we think that should be first. So we're hearing that already. You know, the other interesting thing is this is an over-the-top technology, so there's not a, there's not, there's not someone in the middle, you know, there's not a box in the room that's, you know, the cable box necessarily, you know, that's, that's decoding. There's not all these discussions you have to have about the formats. This could get delivered right to the consumer. So that really, that helps out a lot and, and people will be able to both deliver and consume content. So I you're think right. that's a big plus for it. You're right. That, 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 the, the, barrier, the barrier to entry is much, much lower if the broadcaster can deliver it over the top. Very great, guys. Well, we appreciate your discussion, and hopefully uh, sometime in the near future we'll be able to watch a virtual sports game together from uh, disparate parts of the country. Absolutely. Great. Great luck at us, uh, CES 2014. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate it, guys. It. Thanks a lot.